It's not every day you get a chance to fix a machine that needs major work, and this mower from Troy Built fits that description very well. Now, most people would never consider going through this much work on a single project, but with prices of gasoline mowers almost doubling, it now almost makes sense. But how much work is too much work to save a few bucks? Well, hang on for the next few minutes, and you're about to find out. In today's video, we're going to be looking at this Troy Built Lawn Mower, and the problem is that it has multiple issues we need to fix so we can use it or if we intend on selling it. Now, the first issue and the worst one is that it has a major oil leak coming from somewhere underneath the engine. The other issue this mower has is that the carb is leaking a lot of fuel, which is obviously unsafe. And while we have the mower on the table, we'll also try and figure out why it's a lot tougher to push around than it's supposed to be. Now, I'm going to try and repair this mower, but yours might be a little different, so this might not work on yours. So if things are not working out for you, like in the video, please ask about it. I'll be glad to answer your questions. So what would have happened if I had taken this free mower to a repair shop to get a detailed diagnostic? Well, most big shops would have been backed up with work and would have more than likely passed on it, which only makes sense. But what if I had taken it to an independent shop instead? Well, there's a good chance that they may have had an opening for me, but after paying a rather large fee to have it diagnosed, what they would have found would not have been very good. The report would say that the flywheel key was most likely sheared. They would also recommend a new carb and due to its age would also recommend doing a valve lash inspection and adjustment. They would also report that the engine is leaking a lot of oil and would either require a new sump gasket or worse yet, a new block depending upon how bad the damage really was. The list of repairs would then be broken down to parts and labor and this is where things get really scary. Now the parts total would be close to $80 which sounds pretty fair to be honest but the labor for the work is the part that's going to make you think twice about going through with it. And if I had to guess the labor time for the valve lash inspection, the key and carb replacement, along with a sump gasket, that'd probably be close to three hours, if not more. That means the repair bill could be as low as $260, if not more, and believe me, I'm being kind when it comes to labor and the cost of parts. I could easily see the bill being well over $300, and unless you have an emotional attachment to it, it's simply not worth it. And the reason why is because for just a bit more money than the quoted repair cost, you could get a brand new mower. Now, it may not have all the same features, but it's going to start and run a lot better and with a lot less hassle than if you had this one fixed. Of course, it's your choice, and if you told the repair shop that yes, you'd like to have it fixed, they would gladly fix it. They might think you're being a bit foolish, but they'll take your money just the same. Just keep in mind that after you pay that high repair bill, you're still going to have a used, worn-out mower that's getting a second chance at being useful again, and it's not going to feel like a new mower. Now, after removing all the wheels from the mower, it turns out there's a decent amount of dirt or grime on the axles, so a good cleaning with some brake cleaner and a generous application of lube will more than likely solve our issue with it being tough to push around. Now, you can use whatever lubricant you have lying around. If you want to use motor oil or some other type of light oil to lubricate it, well, that's up to you. For me, I like using lithium grease from a can only because it's very convenient to use. Oh, I almost forgot to mention this, but the lever that controls the speed for the self-propel seems to be stuck. So while we're here, we'll also take a look at the transmission and see if there's an issue with the gear selector. Now, after removing the access cover to the transmission and the belt, which is very handy, you can see that it's pretty packed with old grass clippings. Now, this amount of clippings should not be enough to keep the gear selector from working, but we'll need to clean this area first before we can figure out what's causing our issue. Now that most of the grass clippings have been removed, we can see how it all works. It would appear that when you activate the drive, the transmission moves away from the engine, which then puts tension on the belt. The gear selector lever works this other cable that's supposed to rotate this collar underneath the pulley, which, as you can see, is not happening. Now, my first thought was that the cable was stuck, so to check that, all we need to do is to take off the end of the cable from the collar and see if we can get it to move. And as you can see, the end of the cable is able to move back and forth pretty easily. That means the issue is that the collar might be stuck. If that's the case, there might not be anything we can do about it, but at least the self-propel still works. You just won't be able to go any slower, which isn't as terrible as the drive not working. It's now time for the fun part, and that's of course taking a look inside the engine with the main purpose of inspecting the sump gasket, and this is where things get pretty interesting. So either the gasket is broken and causing our leak, or there's a crack in the block, or worse yet, the sump. After getting all the bolts out of the engine, I'll then gently use my biggest hammer to free it, and then we'll finally see what's causing our leak. So it turns out parts of the gasket stayed on the block, while the rest of it stayed stuck to the sump. And if you take a look, you can see where the gasket stops on the block, but then it should start back up on the sump, but this is where you can see the issue. So this part of the gasket stops right here on the block, and that means the other part should be on the sump, but as you can see, it's not there either. 
So it turns out this part of the gasket has been completely pushed out and disappeared, meaning there was a pretty sizable gap in the gasket, which is plenty of room for oil to leak out of the engine and possibly enough for some water to make it inside as well. After looking around the engine, I didn't see any other issues such as a crack that would cause our leak, so I'm fairly confident that just cleaning up the sump and the block of old gasket material and replacing it should fix our leak. So here's the bigger concern. Why did the gasket break in the first place? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. The spacing for the bolts is rather far apart, and unless the gasket is sealed or glued in place, it's going to eventually fail and blow out. So how do we prevent this from happening again? We certainly can't put more bolts into the engine, right? So in this situation, I'm going to use some RTV to help seal the gasket to the mating surfaces between the bolts. So I'm not going to use the RTV everywhere, I'm only going to use it in certain spots. Now I did consider just using the RTV in place of the paper gasket, but I figured I'd try it out and see what the difference was, and I'm going to tell you I was not impressed at all. The paper gasket was not high density, and at best it was medium density, which means even though it is incredibly thin, it will break down and blow out again in the future, which I think was the point all along. So this is basically a timer for a catastrophic oil leak and could have been avoided by using a slightly heavier paper, but someone at corporate had to save a few dollars on an order for this lighter paper, so it's basically penny pinching at its best. After getting the sump back onto the engine and replacing all the bolts, at least we don't have to wait for the RTV to cure, and instead we get to torque the bolts down and move on to fixing the carb. So the issue with the carb was that it was leaking a lot of fuel and some would either go into the engine or onto the mowing deck, neither of which was a good scenario. The reason is because the needle seat had swollen up and needed to be replaced. Now you can get the seat individually or in a pack of five or more, which is what I would tell you to get just in case you need them for a different project. Now to get the seat out of the carb, you can either use a special tool or you can use a drill bit. Just be careful if you use the bit not to damage the carb. So when installing the new seat, just make sure the rib side goes in first, meaning you want to see the smooth side after you get the seat installed. This always seems a lot harder to do on camera, so this might take you a few tries before you get it facing the right direction. After that, use something to push the seat into the opening as far as it can go, and it should look like this. Once you're satisfied with the seat installation, we'll then carefully put the car back together and then install it back onto the engine. There's just one major problem with doing a seat replacement on a carb, and that is the success rate for it is rather low, at least for me. I think my rate is about 25%, which is not very good in my book. That's why I would always recommend to anyone that you at least consider replacing the carb instead of trying to fix it. You'll see what happens to this one at the end of the video. Now this carb setup is of course an auto choking system and with that it gets pretty busy with linkages, springs and more gaskets than you really want to deal with. So just get used to it unless you get a mower with a throttle lever and an integrated choke but even then that system can be very complicated as well. I will say one thing though and that is if you want a project to have a greater chance of success I'd replace the carb. That way it takes all the guesswork out just in case something doesn't go the way it's supposed to. And yes, if you want to make the argument that using an ultrasonic cleaner will increase that chance, I will agree to that, but it's not going to be 100% and the closest you're ever going to get is by getting a new carb. You can take your pick of an OEM carb or a cheaper aftermarket one, either way it's going to be a very good choice when compared to servicing the original one. And if you do choose to keep the old carb for parts or for later cleaning, that's a great idea, especially if you think you might keep doing this hobby, which can be very therapeutic. Now after getting the car back onto the engine, I am not going to put the mower back onto the ground just yet. And the reason why is because since we took the carb apart and messed with the needle and seat, we need to make sure the carb isn't going to leak any fuel. If it does, we'll be able to work on it while it's still on the table. All we need to do is put a small amount of fuel into the tank and give it some time and check to see if the carb is going to leak any fuel. Now this test is going to take a few minutes, so I would just be prepared to wait for it or walk off and do something for the next 5 minutes. And by that time you're done doing whatever it is, you should be able to tell if it's going to leak any fuel. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, this carb is not leaking like it was before, but it's far from perfect. There was still some fuel sitting around the bowl area, but it never made it onto the mowing deck. So if I had to guess, I think the bowl gasket is the reason why it was still having an issue. So in the meantime, I'm going to leave it the way that it is and see if it gets any better or worse, and then I'll decide what to do with it. After that, I'll then put some oil into the engine, making sure not to overfill it. Then we'll get it back onto the ground and see how much easier it is to pull. Now the first time we did a pull test, the best reading we got was 2.8 kilograms, which is a bit outside of the normal range for a mower like this one. 
However, after cleaning and lubricating the wheels, the new and improved reading is now 1.8 kilograms, which is a huge improvement, and if you hadn't guessed it, it's now a lot easier to use. So even with the pull strength of a six-year-old, I was still able to start the mower with a single pull, which I think is a huge improvement from before, but it's not all good. As you can hear, the starter poles are making contact with the flywheel posts, which sounds terrible. Anyone wanting to buy this mower would certainly think twice about it after hearing those sounds, and no amount of excuses is going to convince them that it's okay to buy it. That means I'm going to have to try and fix it so that it doesn't make that noise, otherwise there's no way I'm going to be able to sell it. At least there's no oil or chocolate milk being sprayed all over the mowing deck like it was before, but unfortunately this mower is still far away from being done. I will say one thing though, I think I'm going to order a new carb for this one, and even though it's not leaking like it was before, I don't like the idea that the carb is leaking any fuel. And I'm doing it more out of liability than anything else, but the best part is that this carb is surprisingly very cheap considering that this engine is not very common. Don't worry though, I won't bother showing me swapping out the car, but I did want to at least mention it. Now, I didn't do a compression test on this engine, and the reason why is because I didn't see a need to. However, if I thought there might be an issue where I thought the engine might be a bit worn out, then yes, I would have done the test. Now, I might still do it later on, just for my information, but I feel as though I might be wasting my time, so I might not bother showing it on screen, but I will show it if there's something interesting about the results. But when an engine starts with just one pull, it's hard to argue that the engine might be worn out. So my question is, do you think I spent too much time and more importantly money on this project? I think the parts total for this one was about $25, but the time might be more than I want to admit. But then again, if I sold this mower in today's market, I should make a pretty good profit. Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate your time here. Please feel free to ask me any questions about this project or about your own projects. And I hope to see you in the next video.